Hello, I'm Hazm Seeker. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, gold, oil, copper. As commodity prices collapse, is the boom time over? After hitching a ride on China's economic boom, can commodity exporting nations avoid recession? And when the money runs out, Brazil's creaking infrastructure, the government takes a knife to education funding. And when China isn't buying, is there an alternative for copper? And on the road to stop the multi-billion dollar trade in illegal frozen chicken, we'll tell you why Nigeria is trying to stop the trade. While well, China's stock market crash was big news, but lost in the headlines was the commodities route. Everything from copper to oil, cotton to sugar has been hit. And unlike stock markets, commodities have an impact on everyday lives. From farmers to miners to consumers to governments, lower prices means less money and fewer jobs. Let's just focus on one such commodity, gold. It is often seen as a store of wealth in uncertain times. But right now, gold has stumbled below $1,100 an ounce to a five-year low. What's behind the slump? Well, China and India are the world's biggest buyers of gold. Beijing declared its holding of gold at 1,658 tons. That was way, way below what the market expected. Indian households own $1 trillion in gold. But because of weak monsoon rains, many farmers who make up two-thirds of domestic demand are just not buying right now. And with economic growth around the world slowing and expectations of a rise in U.S. interest rates by the end of the year, the dollar is strengthening, making gold less attractive. Now that's led some to predict that gold prices could fall to as low as $750 an ounce. That's a far cry from the $1,920 it hit during the financial crisis. Well, as commodity prices collapse, it now becomes apparent that China's three-decade economic rise has been the catalyst for the rise of many nations. The failure of those nations to invest and find new sources of growth has also been exposed by China's economic slowdown. The International Monetary Fund called on Australia to diversify its economy as a decade-long mining boom comes to an end. The government expects income from resource exports to fall 11% to $128 billion in the year through June. In Bolivia, angry miners blockaded the city of Potosi, the heartland of Bolivia's mining industry. The miners are complaining that there has been no investment in airports, bridges and hydroelectric plants. And in Brazil, the economy is expected to contract 1.5% this year. Again, that's because of an end to the commodities boom and fiscal stimulus. A corruption scandal at state-owned oil company Petrobras that has many of the political and business elite under investigation has sapped confidence. Consumers are spending less as unemployment rises. And the government of President Dilma Rousseff has taken a knife to education spending, and that's hit students hard. In a moment, a report from Kimberly Halkett in Rio. But first, with gold prices at a five-year low, you would think that some of the world's biggest consumers would be rushing out to buy the yellow metal. But that's not been the case. Nidhi Dutt in Delhi explains why. Puja Puri is looking for a bargain. She wants to buy gold jewelry that she'll enjoy for years and one day pass on to her daughter. And there's good reason why she's doing it now. Prices are low, so it's a good time for me to invest my money in gold. With the price of gold at a five-year low, jeweler Rishi Kapoor should be excited. Indians have traditionally bought gold, which they consider to be a reliable investment. This sentiment has kept Kapoor's family in business for 45 years. But the recent low prices have meant fewer customers. We were expecting more customers with the gold rate hitting low, but the market is really slow. There are a number of reasons why Indians aren't putting their savings in gold right now, from wedding season yet to begin to renewed investor confidence in currencies like the U.S. dollar. Traders across the country see this as a huge change of heart in a market that prides itself on its big appetite for the yellow metal. When the price of gold crashed two years ago, this store was full of enthusiastic shoppers. But today, despite the low prices, customers are hard to find. A sign some analysts say that Indians aren't rushing to the rescue of the global gold industry. 
And for millions of consumers here, a turn away from gold isn't necessarily a bad thing. From a micro perspective, to the extent that low gold prices are inducing savers to diversify their portfolios, you know, look at other uh, financial assets in particular that are more attractive, uh, then that's good for the financial sector because we want people to move away from, from gold into you know, bank products and other savings products. For generations, buying gold has been a tradition for millions of Indians like Puri. And while it may have lost its luster for now, traders are hoping it's only a matter of time before customers return to a much-loved investment. Two people. Andrew's dormitory bedroom is designed for just one person. Instead, there are three beds crammed in this space. There's also no bathroom. The sink and the toilet were removed. They were so decrepit, they were dangerous. Here, there is an electric shower head with the cables exposed. People used to have a shower here. It was really dangerous. This is the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's most prestigious university, and it's in an advanced state of decay. Vinicius is learning the art of industrial design, except there are no materials to work with, so the students improvise. We made this replica of that machine out of cardboard because we didn't have the metal to work with. New infrastructure has been promised, but as with these dormitories, construction very often has been halted due to a lack of funding. It's not just the Federal University of Rio that is struggling. There are more than 50 public universities all across Brazil that are trying to cope with the budget cuts. That's because the government has more than doubled enrollment. In just the past seven years at this particular university, attendance has risen from 30 to 60,000 students. For months there have been often violent demonstrations around the country in protest. Students have also launched a nationwide strike, along with some school administrators, to press the government for more funding. There was a massive expansion in education in 2007, but that was not accompanied by funding in the same proportion as the number of new students. Al Jazeera asked government officials for an explanation. Our request for an interview was turned down. They could make cuts from other places. You don't cut the basic things. Education is the basis for everything. And if you cut it, things will start to fall apart and the country will collapse. Some could argue that's already happening. As campus infrastructure crumbles, students have been forced to transform their dormitory into a campground. Right, let's get some insights into what's happening in the gold and copper market. Joining us from Perth is Mark Connolly, the non-executive chairman of gold and copper exploration company West African Resources. Oh, Mark, does the uh, fall in gold prices have you reconsidering your investments in Mali or Burkina Faso? No, I don't think it does. I think it just means that uh, we, we, we need to look at other opportunities for, uh, for those investments with respect to uh, you know, the cost structure that we have. And in the oil industry, more than $200 billion worth of projects have been shelved. Are you finding it difficult to raise money for projects? Um, I think if the project um, you know, is, warrants uh, you know, investment, I think uh, it, it clearly... Um, there is available capital both um, from, from you know, traditional debt financiers and uh, some forms of equity, plus private equity as well. So I think um, you know, it's, it's not without its challenges, but I think on the merits of each project, um, it's certainly still doable. So where do you see the price of gold in the next 12 months or so? <laughs> Certainly in the last uh, 12 months, uh, I don't think anyone's been able to call the price of gold. So uh, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert, um, that, that's for sure. Um, you know, clearly um, I would like to see it above its current levels around uh, 1100 US dollars per ounce. Um, it would be great to, to have a 1200 to $1,300 uh, you know, gold price, and uh, that would certainly stimulate um, you know, lots of investment. Um, personally, I think it, um, you know, somewhere between the eleven to twelve hundred uh, dollar range would would, would be uh, a very good price. So, how important to the market is China for both gold and copper? 
I'll, I'll speak for gold because I probably know it better than uh, you know the base metals. Um, China is important. I think um, other emerging economies are just as important. Uh, India um, as well. Um, you know, there, there's demand and supply, and I think uh, gold will you know in some you know form will always be the traditional uh, you know safe haven for investment, and certainly uh, you know. Uh, the market of uh, is there for uh, you know for that demand and if we just go back to copper prices for a moment with copper prices at six-year lows when does it become unprofitable to mine well, it's a very good question I think you know every company has its uh, its own cost structure and and obviously you know their ability to to you know uh, insulate themselves against that cost uh, and what it costs to mine um, and, and then there's other mechanisms, you know, companies may, uh, you know, at a particular time, high grade uh, mines rather than uh, treat uh, lower grade material. Um, you know, they, uh, so it, it's, it's very much dependent on the company in question. All right, there are a lot of miners who've said that they'll start cutting jobs if this continues. Is this something that will accelerate? I think that uh, it's, it's been evident that, uh, you know, jobs and, and cost, you know, uh, you know, cost cutting is certainly uh, an aspect of the business and, and many companies have taken measures to reduce their costs and, and you know, remain profitable for, them, for their shareholders. I think that's prudent. I think that's, um, uh, you know, something that's uh, been necessitated by the, the commodity price falls. Um, it, and it's, uh, it's an unfortunate nature of the business at times that people will uh, lose their jobs. Mark Connolly in Perth, thanks very much for being with us. Right, let's take a look at some of the political fallout from the falling price of commodities. And we're going to focus on Latin America with Carlos Caicedo, who's the principal Latin America analyst at IHS. Uh, Carlos, thanks for being with us. Now, I want to start with Brazil. Here was a nation uh, under Lula that economically did really well. And now under Dilma Rousseff, the country's been forced to revise its economic growth. How much of this has to do with commodities? Well, uh, in large part because the super cycle kept hidden all the weakness of the Brazilian economy. It's a very uncompetitive economy, a very protectionist country. And what kept the economy going strongly was that plus an explosion in consumption. And the two drivers have come to an end now. And then uh, basically what Brazil needs to do now is to put the house in order and make the economy more competitive. They want to uh, recover the level of growth they had before. Well, let's just focus on Dilma Rousseff. There is a, a movement to impeach the president over the Petrobras so-called car wash scandal. What's the likelihood of this? Well, at the moment, we, we consider that possibility low. And the main reason is, despite the low popularity of Dilma Rousseff, just 7% on the last opinion polls, uh, the opposition is not clear on what way to take forward. And at the same time, uh, the division within the ruling coalition and the main allied party, the PNDB, is not clear either on what way to take. So it's more a question not of Dilma Rousseff not being weak, but the opposition being split and not clear about the way forward. And this basically will delay a decision on how to impeach Dilma Rousseff. The, the other point is uh, there is no any strong evidence linking directly the president uh, Dilma Rousseff to the corruption allegation. So there is no uh, an smoking gun, if you want to use that expression. Well, there's criticism out there that not enough has been done uh, during the boom times uh, and that there should be more investing in education and infrastructure. Do you think that's justified? I don't think um, partially, but I think uh, Brazil has made some progress on infrastructure. The, the only difficulty we see there is that it hasn't been uh, large enough and fast enough. Um, there has been improvement in, on the airport. There are a significant positive plan for ports, highways, but instead of taking uh, two or three years that they planned before, it could take five or 10 years. It's more a question of delivery and implementation. 
but there has been significant investment in the sector. The problem is uh, delivery. But eventually, infrastructure in Brazil should improve. So what's been done then to escape this uh, commodity trap, to develop other parts of the economy? Well, that's precisely the, 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 the challenge Brazil is facing, because they didn't match to diversify. On the contrary, uh, I think one of the, 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 the problems for Brazil is that manufacturing used to be 45% uh, of total export before the commodity boom, and now it could be 35%. So Brazil has become more dependent on commodities and, and therefore less diversified. And that's what possibly the benefit will come out from this crisis is that Brazil will need to think very hard about how to rebalance the economy, how to diversify the economy and move away from depending too much on commodities. Carlos Caicedo at IHS in London. Thank you for talking to us. Now, Chile is the biggest producer and exporter of copper, which is used in our mobile phones, our computers, and even our coins. Unsurprisingly, as demand for the red metal slows, Chile is looking at other uses for copper. Soon, it may be on your feet, even in your clothes. Monsieur Newman tells us about innovative ways to make life easier with copper. Running or even walking wasn't always pleasant for Hugo Saldias. It made his feet sweat and smell to the extreme. But that was before he bought copper socks. They reduce sweating on my feet and avoid bacteria and other unwanted problems. Chile is the world's number one producer and exporter of this metal, traditionally used for conducting heat and electricity. But now Chilean scientists and entrepreneurs are putting it to new use. It protects you from bacteria, which is what produces bad odor and fungus, like athlete's foot. It really works. From clogs and sandals to the number one bestseller, socks, copper is being used to produce an inhospitable environment for bacteria. In fact, the first thing you see when you arrive at Santiago's International Airport is copper. Here at immigration, the counter is 100% antibacterial and 100% made out of copper. Officials say it made a big difference. So we noticed that the change in our workers' health. So uh, there, is a percent, there is a lower percentage of people that get sick in our staff. But extracting copper salt from the metal to bind it with plastic and thread was a challenge that took its creators more than three years. Now the company is making medical uniforms and sports clothes with reinforced copper strategically located where people perspire most. There are also copper keyboards and computer mice. A recent study confirmed that a mouse and keyboard have more germs and bacteria than a toilet seat. So germs beware. It seems copper may be man's new best friend even from day one. And still ahead on counting the cost, the illegal trade in frozen chicken were on the road as Nigeria tries to enforce a decade-old ban. We'll find out why. Now, motorbike taxis are a popular means of transport in congested cities in Indonesia. But new companies offering the same service with more efficiency and ease are gaining popularity. Steph Vassen reports from Jakarta. It started with a mobile phone application. Now, six months later, Gojek has more than one million users and 11,000 motorbike drivers delivering services in congested cities across Indonesia. Customers place orders on their phones and motorbike taxi drivers like Marcelina accept them taking people quickly to their destinations, delivering food orders or packages, so people don't have to sit in their cars for hours. Gojek is more efficient. It saves time, it saves energy, and it saves money. Gojek is a professional version of Indonesia's traditional motorbike taxis called Ojeks that can be found at many street corners. We're actually not selling multiple services, what we are essentially selling is time. And that has got to be one of the most precious commodities uh, being an urban dweller. 
Um, and so it works because both sides of the platform are benefiting immensely. This is often the only way to get around in Jakarta or other big cities in Indonesia. But the success of the Gojek or Grabbike has also its downside. Drivers have been facing violence or threats from other traditional motorbike taxis because they can't stand the competition. In several areas, traditional drivers or Ojeks have placed banners ordering Gojek drivers not to enter their neighborhoods. My motorbike was hit with sticks and I was chased. It happens a lot now. Nanang has been an Ojek driver for more than eight years after the company he worked for went bankrupt. He says since Gojek started its services, his income has been halved. These businessmen sit in their offices with their mobile phones and make money. We do the real work. I don't want us poor people to be humiliated like that. But Nanang and tens of thousands of Ojek drivers are facing a difficult future. Jakarta's governor is supporting the new motorbike taxi services. This Gojek application could solve this Ojek problem. Ojek say they are losing a lot of money. The competition no, 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 is... No, no, of money. You have to follow this technology. Gojek tries to lower tensions by sending in special teams to approach Ojek drivers. But some are worried those tensions could turn into something worse if their efforts are not successful. Now, the Nigerian government has launched a new effort to stop illegal imports of frozen chicken. They were banned over a decade ago, but local producers say it's been poorly enforced, and that's affecting public health. Yvonne Dege reports. It's 3 a.m., and we're with a team from Nigeria Customs on one of the roads that links Benin Republic to Nigeria in a good state. They're on the lookout for frozen chicken smugglers. It's a trade they say is losing Nigeria nearly $3 billion a year in lost income. After four hours of waiting, the smugglers appear. They spot customs officials and flee into the bush, abandoning the chicken and their vehicles. Importing frozen chicken has been banned since 2003 to help stimulate local production. But a government-backed study published in July found that the law is not being enforced and that imported frozen chicken that gets through is unfit for human consumption. Local producers like Femi Fani are the worst affected. At his farm in the Igbesha Ogun state, he produces 250,000 chickens a year. If the illegal importation of frozen chicken was stopped, he says he would produce 750,000. They bring in unwholesome, you know, really bad chickens, which of course they can sell at a much uh, lower prices than I can. And uh, the public, unfortunately, at times, do not recognize the difference. A locally produced chicken costs around $8 per bird. A smuggled chicken, around $2. The Nigeria Customs Service is destroying over a 1,000 boxes of smuggled frozen chicken they seized on Wednesday night. But it's a fraction of the chicken being smuggled in, and they're struggling to destroy it all. Part of the problem is the importation of these chickens is not banned in Benin Republic, and there's not enough locally produced chicken to meet demand. We really have to arrange the culprits and take them to the court or arrange them before, before the court of competent jurisdiction. And that will serve deterrent. And I, I, can, I want to assure you, anybody who will arrest and the moment we secure conviction, we put him on the front page of papers so that at least Nigerians know that he's an unpatriotic Nigerian and he's the person who wants to kill you. One solution to ending the illegal trade is to improve power supply to farms like Femi's to increase production and improve the road so he can get chicken to his customers. Until then, it's likely the frozen chicken smugglers will continue trying to import the goods into Nigeria. And that is our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. And that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Hazem Seeker from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.